everybody, I'm Lee Blickley from HuffPost, and today we're in for a Downton Abbey reunion of sorts as actor Elizabeth McGovern, writer Julian Fellows, and director Michael Engler are here to discuss their new project, The Chaperone. The masterpiece movie is based on the novel of the same name and takes place in the roaring early 1920s. It follows a Kansas woman, Norma Carlyle, who has chosen to chaperone a budding 15-year-old dancer, Louise Brooks, to New York for the summer. But as it turns out, Norma is on a path to self-discovery as well. Let's take a peek at the trailer. Louise has recently been accepted to study dance in New York. She can't go without a chaperone. We haven't been able to find anyone. I'd like to propose myself. Honey, don't you think? I would. I'd like to go. I think we're going to have a wonderful time. <laughs> what did you think? That they were going to have their way with me in the dining car under the table? Men don't like candy that's been unwrapped. <laughs> I have not said anything funny. This is it. Welcome, all of you. Look at her. She's the best. The girl's a star. What can I do for you? I want to learn about my birth parent, sister. I'm afraid I can't help you with that. I want to know who I am. Are you happy with Mr. Carlisle? Of course I am. I'm very happy. You look so happy. How much will it be? No charge. I know you're pretty and the boys like you, but I'm here to protect you. I get the ice cream and they get the pleasure of my company. Are you okay? I've come a long way to find my records. You might be able to help me. Mrs. O'Dell? Always did Floyd take advantage of you? She will need to prove that she can adhere to the moral code of Delachon. I didn't think I would see you again. You've been so kind to me and yet no reason. You took such a risk. People can surprise you. They certainly can. Let's welcome Julian Fellows, Elizabeth McGovern, and Michael Engler. Thank you guys for being here. Now, does that take you all back to Downton Abbey? It really, it just gives me the vibes. It's so wonderful. <laughs> um, and you three have worked together for many years on Downton Abbey. As, as recently as last week. <laughs> oh, well, oh my gosh. I can't wait to talk a little bit about that too. But right. tell me, Michael, how you got um, involved in directing The Chaperone, because I know this is your first film directorial debut, correct? Uh, I got involved because of my relationship with Elizabeth and Julian on Downton, and it seemed... I live in New York, mm -hmm. and it was a story that they had been working on putting together and was going to shoot in New York, so it seemed like a, a good okay. fit. Yeah. And Elizabeth, you had been a part of this project for a few years, right? Kind of talk us through how um, you decided to bring the chaperone to the big screen um, and how long that process was, because it, it seems like it was a little I while. I was sitting <laughs> in a little studio eight years ago mm -hmm. reading a book for type. I was recording it, and which I do quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And as I was reading, a light bulb went off in my head. It's never happened to me before. And I said, this, this has to be a movie. And um, so the obvious person to take it to is the genius sitting obvious next to me. Uh, I mean, I happened to be seeing him most days, <laughs> which uh, made the idea even more obvious. And, uh, and he seized it and uh, had a great take on the story. It wasn't a, a totally straightforward thing to adapt mm -hmm. uh, because uh, it, it is a story that spanned in the book form many, many generations and goes into the 1960s. And he decided to focus on this summer that these two characters, these two unlikely characters, spend together in New York and the awakening that occurs as a result. And the rest, as they say, is history. I mean, yeah. that, was, that was the easy part. Yeah. And Julian, had you read Laura Moriarty's book, uh, The Chaperone, before uh, you, Elizabeth had come to you with the idea? No, no, no I hadn't. I, I went and had lunch with Elizabeth and her husband, Simon Curtis, and uh, they had this idea. So I sort of crept away and read the book then. Um, and I absolutely loved it, actually, because I, I'm always very interested in periods of change, mm -hmm. social change and how people deal with it and some people go with it and some people fight it and exactly the same as now. Uh, and the 20s was an extraordinary period for women, for uh, organized labor, for transport, for everything. And this was a wonderful little story in the middle of that period of these two women 
coming from completely different kind of emotional places and the journey they made together in New York, which was a new land for them both, uh, I thought it was wonderfully done. Yeah, and how was the writing process for you? Did it kind of, did you sit down and it just all came out? Or was it a little difficult to get those little intricacies of each well, woman's when, story? When you're adapting, I mean, it's, it's different. When you're writing, um, well, they call it an original screenplay. Of course, nothing's original, yeah. really. But, but, you know, <laughs> you're making it up. Then, to a certain extent, you shape it. Uh, whereas adaption, adaptation is a different thing. Because you're taking one form, a book, or a newspaper article, or a, something or other, and you're trying to turn it into a film. And so the initial process is you're reading this book, and of course then you read it again and so on, and you're trying to find the film. Mm -hmm. Where in this is the movie? Uh, and that uh, is sort of the key as to whether or not you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes you can absolutely love a book, but as you read it, you think, Actually, this is a book. <laughs> it, it, it's yeah. not a film. Uh, but in this one, I felt there was a rather marvelous, rather fine film in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I hope that's what we've done. Yes, it's wonderful. And Elizabeth, you were a producer. Did you know that you wanted to play the role of Norma I uh, did, from the yes. beginning? Yeah, I mean, I don't consider myself to be genius as a producer. I mean, I wouldn't even begin to attempt to call myself that in any other um, incarnation, except for the fact that I really wanted to play the part. Yeah, what, what was it about this character that kind of drew you to want to play her? Uh, well, she's a woman in her middle age who uh, has uh, an awakening. And I, I think it's a very interesting thing to think that that can happen to somebody at any time and in a very unexpected way. And it is to do with her brushing up against a very young girl who she doesn't expect to learn anything from. And for me, that, that is an intriguing idea and very true to my experience of life. I mean, I feel that I've made it into my 50s, but I still am learning and uh, making discoveries about myself. And I, I think it's, uh, it's nice for people to see a story in which that's happening because it's a very unusual story to see. We don't, we don't see women in their 50s represented very much at all in movies or yeah. television, much less being the ones that have a chance to grow and discover. That's usually happening with the younger people. And, but I do think that it can happen at any point in anyone's life. But what's good about this, I think, is that it isn't just the thing that the kids know everything and the older people learn from the kids and everyone has a party on the beach, which we've all <laughs> seen lots of times. There are elements to Norma that she does believe in and she does stick up for herself. And she doesn't concede that everything Louise says and everything Louise does is right. Mm -hmm. And that, I, I think, is a, is a good dimension too because it, it also is a process of her building her faith in herself. Mm. And, of course, significantly at the end, she has something to give to Louise that's very important. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Well, I was going to say also, I think one of the things that's most unusual about it is a lead character who's a woman in her 50s whose story is a fundamentally sexual one, mm -hmm. sexual that, that looks at a woman that age as a complex sexual being, yeah. you know, who has the right to have agency over that. And, and for that to grow and change at that point in her life. And um, th there's something sort of quietly radical about that, yeah. I think, in terms of what's everywhere else in the media. Yeah. Is, yeah, that's interesting, too, because Haley Lou Richardson's character, Louise Brooks, is kind of on her own path. But you're really focusing on Norma and how it kind of compares to what you know a younger woman is doing in this age, which was the 1920s. And it was an age of experimentation, and women were finding their voices. Uh, did that draw you in, too, is seeing the parallel between these two women, but having that woman in her middle age kind of be the focus um, yeah, over I mean, what I woman? find so um, energized about the story is that, of course, Louise Brooks not only was experiencing this revolution that was the 20s mm -hmm. for women in America, the flapper era, she personified it. She was the, the spearhead, the poster girl for it. And so Norma's personal story is kind of the same as most average American women at that time, making discoveries, as Michael rightly says, that they have a right to, to a sexual life, to sexual happiness, to sexual exploration. That was something that I don't think women felt they had a right 
to. Even today, I think many women don't. And, and Norma uh, finds that this discovery about herself is a kind of a path to her having, having con control over her own happiness. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Did that sort of draw you into wanting to direct this and bring this to life? Because it is a very powerful story in general, but right now, too, in our culture, it's a perfect story about two women um, in this age. It did, it did. And you know, it's interesting because I, I know I have a couple of very close people in my life um, who are young women mm -hmm. and a lot of friends my age, women. And I feel what's interesting is the uh, generational tension and mutual interest is very similar now. I think a lot of older women feel that sort of the millennials don't quite understand and appreciate what they had to go through and how we got where we are and the kind of rights that they just assume mm -hmm. uh, are part of the world. And I think similarly, you know, the generation of women who were r really raised in the Victorian era and then suddenly this group of young people come up in the 20s and sort of say, oh, that's all worth nothing. Mm -hmm. We're throwing that all away and not understanding the reason the film takes place a year after women get the vote here. That didn't just happen because all these women were quiet and sitting back yeah. and waiting for the next generation to come along. So I did feel that there was something very current in that and useful or just, just the way that history cycles the same stories over again. And that's why certain stories become very interesting to tell at certain moments. That's why I think this one is now, or one, one of the reasons. Yeah. And Julian, you write beautifully for women. Uh, but is it tricky to understand women when you're writing a script? Because you're a man. <laughs> um, well, I'm glad I write beautifully for them. You do. Um, I think women, uh, particularly in period, inevitably become the, the more interesting characters because they were having to get round so much and having to put up with so much. And particularly if you were ambitious, if you were clever, you know, just as many women were then as there are now, but they were operating around all these limitations and restrictions and strictures and everything from the corset to the vote was working against them. And so that gives you characters who, if they are strong and intelligent, are, are always pushing against something, mm -hmm. which is fun to dramatize. But what I like about this story, too, is that Norma is a kind person. She, in a sense, becomes a revolutionary, but she is a kind revolutionary. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want to hurt people. She doesn't want to ruin their lives. She just finally discovers she has the right to her own life mm -hmm. and that there is nothing wrong with feeling that she wants to be happy. And, and that I love. I mean, I, you know, you can write about people who just take the sword out and slash everything they see in front of them, but that isn't who she is. She doesn't want to hurt people. She just discovers she has the right to be happy. Mm -hmm. And that's really what the film is about. Yeah, and it's beautiful. And you mentioned the corset, which is kind of a, a big part in this movie, is, you know, Norma finally removes her corset, both literally and figuratively. Um, talk about that a little bit, Elizabeth, and what it's like to kind of get into the mindset of a woman living during this time and, and discovering who she is. Well, I can say, as someone who's worn a corset <laughs> quite a lot over the years, that when Norma says at the very end, um, when she's asked, did you ever put it on again? And she says, no, I never did. I kind of hope Elizabeth McGovern will say, no, I never did after this movie. <laughs> <laughs> we could probably leave it at that. Yeah. Like, I don't want to put a course. Not again, <laughs> please. No more. But I have to say the costumes in this, like they are in Downton Abbey, are amazing and beautiful. Uh, did you work with the same costume designers who worked on Downton Abbey? No, it was a completely new Different. group of people, pretty much all New York based. Mm -hmm. Candace Donnelly did the costumes. They're magnificent and you know on a very tight budget a very limited schedule a very small crew it's kind of magical what she yeah. what she achieved yeah. so when everyone walks on set you know in these costumes and just the sets itself I'm um, kind of going back in time how does that feel as a director does that really automatically inspire you it does it does I mean and you know it's interesting because Haley Lou Richardson mm -hmm. who plays Louise had never done anything in period before and she said um, she had done a few films and she said, you know, honestly, in all the films I've done, I mostly wore clothes from my own closet. Mm -hmm. And she said to go through hair and makeup like this, to put on these clothes, she said, it just automatically got her 
She said, oh, you have to stand like this. Oh, you, right, you have to be careful this. And oh, you're always wearing gloves. And you know, all these different things that just create and in some ways restrain or shape behavior um, that it's the same thing when the set's like that and the location's like that and the extras are all dressed like that. Uh, it, it does naturally make it easier to imagine because frankly, you don't have to imagine that much. You start to see it and then you just bring out the details. Yeah, and for you, Elizabeth, I'm sure it's putting on your day clothes regularly is a little more tricky because you're always in these period costumes, correct? Yeah, I just <laughs> don't know how to put on a pair of trousers. <laughs> Um, but talk about Haley Lou. She's had a really uh, stellar few years, um, and it was really nice to see her in this in this role. How is it working with her and you know helping her in these period this period kind of piece? It was absolutely delightful. We, she came in at the very last minute, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean that kid just has kid. <laughs> uh, that woman has so much poise. I mean, we just threw so much at her. And uh, she embraced it all calmly and then did this dancing, which um, I have to say is, is one of the most magical things in, in the movie. And the way Michael's shot that is so charming and wonderful. I mean, we just really we got, got so down. lucky. That's we got her it. dancing, right? That is her yeah. dancing, and you know, she she, trained as a dancer all through her teens, and it was in her late teens that she started thinking she might want to uh, act mm -hmm. as a, you know, creatively, professionally. I think what's interesting, too, is I have had the experience a number of times of working with dancers as actors, and, and it's very similar with athletes. They come with this innate sense of discipline mm -hmm. and understanding that they are part of a bigger thing they have to know what they're doing. They have to rehearse it. They have to feel good about it. But they, they just have this kind of work ethic and uh, ability to, to, to know that, the, that it all has to happen in the moment. Yeah. You know, you, it's not so much about the, OK, we'll do another take. We'll do another take. It's like each time they have this focus, this ability to just say, OK, I'm going to be, I need to be in the present right now to do this dance or to do this scene. Or but she's wonderfully like wild. Too. Yeah. She's, mm -hmm. she's sort of marching to the rhythm of her own drum yeah, yeah, all the yeah, time. Yeah. So you put her in these costumes, she looks wonderful, and, or you do the dances, whatever, but she's completely her own person. She's very unfrightened mm -hmm. by the whole filming process. You know, sometimes you get someone very young on a set and it's all a bit daunting and all the rest. Totally not for Haley. She just was absolutely having a great time and doing her own thing, and that was very right for Louise. I mean, Louise. Yeah. Brooks was someone who wrote her own program, yeah. you know, and, and she didn't care how other people did things. Mm -hmm. She did it in her own way. Uh, and that was why she became the inspiration of a generation. But Hayes got that too, and I felt we, or we, Michael got the most out of her in that, really. Yeah. Now, had you planned those in your scripts, these dance uh, breaks? Had you written it in your script that, oh, there would be a dance here and a dance oh, here? Oh, so all of that part of the story is true. Mm -hmm. What is interesting is that the fact that Louise Brooks came up from Wichita and trained in dance uh, with the um, thing, I mean, Dennis Shawn dancers uh, in New York and was brought by a chaperone, that's all true. Yeah. What, the only thing that is elaborated is that we don't know much about the real chaperone. Mm -hmm. So uh, Laura Moriarty has kind of created the character of Norma to be the chaperone and she has her own story. But all the Louise stuff, uh, is absolutely what happened. And then she went, joined the Dennis Shawn, as we have, when she joined the Dennis Shawn dancers, then she went from there to the Ziegfeld Follies, and from the Follies, she went to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the trail she blasted. Yeah, and she was, of course, a star in these iconic silent films. Uh, but you did mention how no one knew much about the chaperone. And I do like, did you enjoy that too, Elizabeth, how, you know, um, Louise Brooks is in the story and people might be focusing uh, on how she came about and how her career happened, but then you have this other character, um, and that's really who the focus of the movie well, it, is on. Yeah, I mean, for me, that's the magic of the story, and it's referencing a bit what Julian was talking about earlier, is that you have these revolutionaries that are very obvious, and they're holding banners, and they're changing the world, but 
What it really takes to change the world are these quiet revolutionaries, the, the people that probably since the beginning of time have just worked it out, have worked out how to do something and make it work within whatever system they're trapped in. Mm -hmm. And you just know most of the people out there in the world are doing some version of that. And that's a quiet revolutionary. They're doing it their way personally with the people they love. They're making it work for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that is the character that is impacted by these poster children for revolution. It's all those other people that are fixing their lives to make it happy, to make it work, to make it healthy, to make it human and, and uh, rich. Yeah. And, and you know, society will do what it will do on the surface. And underneath, there's always been women who have just made it work for themselves. And, and Julian's an expert on, on writing those kind of women, yeah. I think. I think he's created two of those characters for me. Yeah. Because the other one in Downton Abbey is a bit like that, I think, too. And, you know, she seems so meek, but under the surface, she's. She knows what she's doing. Mm -hmm. Well, she arrived having had an American education, which put her essentially 25 years ahead of the women in England. <laughs> yeah, thank you very and, much. Uh, <laughs> we don't hear that very much yeah. from well, an English but person. But at the beginning of the series, she's having to swallow it and lock it up and keep it to herself and all the rest of it. And as the show went on, she got more and more uh, courageous and outspoken about her views, yeah. uh, which I think was truthful. I mean, I think those American women who came over in the great tidal wave of the Buccaneers, they must have all felt relief as gradually London started to mm. catch up. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was some, one of the arcs we traced, really, in the show. Well, yeah, Downton is all, you know, all about women kind of starting their own revolutions and advancing um, in their own way and, and embracing change. Uh, but I can't wait to see what this movie is going to be about. I know you guys can't talk too much about it. <laughs> But you have to tell us something. How was the experience of making, uh, you know, this beloved show into a film? It was really great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't say anything else. Uh, so uh, are you guys still shooting or is it no. post-production? No, post-production. Um, so you can't tell us much about what happens, but how was the experience going back uh, it, to Downton? It was fantastic. I, I was worried that people might be just punching in or mm -hmm. coming obligatorily or just to be team players or something. But I think people, that group, cast and crew, and a lot of the crew was back too, so genuinely liked and respected each other mm -hmm. that I think they were really happy to see each other. And it was a very defined amount of time. And I think everybody just felt like uh, it was a kind of a great opportunity to celebrate and enjoy the experience that they had been part of for yeah. so long. How was it for you slipping back into Cora? After a little bit of time, was it kind of special? Did it make you really embrace the opportunity again to play this character? It was nice for me to see the cast. Yeah. That was my favorite yeah. bit of it. Um, were you guys able to come see the exhibit that was in New York? I did, I did. It I was thought amazing. that was incredible, yeah. Was um, for us fans, it was so cool to walk into that, that world. Um, are you, do you think fans will be satisfied with what, what you've done? Well, I hope so. I mean, um, you know, certainly, we want them to be. We, ha we, we won't sort of push them away. We've given them what we hope is a super version of the Downton Abbey experience. Uh, and, and I hope they love it. Yeah. I love it. If well, I love it. If you love it, then I'm going to love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a few questions from the audience. So who's first? Here we go. I want to ask the entire cast, how was it like recreating 1920s New York? Because obviously New York right now looks nothing like how it did in period. <laughs> yeah. So what were the challenges behind recreating the world of Norma and, and what Louis saw? Um, well, they were considerable <laughs> <laughs> on, a, on a very tight schedule and budget. And you know, period automatically, any kind of period work automatically is more labor intensive in a lot of ways because every piece of clothing, you know, you can't just sort of be rehearsing a scene in the kitchen and just say, oh, you know what, we need some paper towels, run out and get paper towels. Everything has to be from the period, so everything has to be found or created beforehand, whether it's clothing, hair, makeup, props, locations. So a big part of it was having the locations be in places that we didn't have to do a lot to. And uh, Andrew Jackness, who was the production designer, knows New York like the back of his hand, and found beautiful places that are 
still intact, streets that are still very much unspoiled. Um, so that's the main thing. It's, you, it's wanting to sort of suggest things that you can't show because you, you can't get big enough because it's not a, a big scale movie. Um, to try to suggest them in the details and in the locations that we were and then when we had the occasional opportunity to go bigger to really embrace that and share that. Actually, there's more of 20s New York surviving than sometimes people think. It's, it's, it's rather like Gilded Age New York, which I'm also working on in another thing, that if you go up Fifth Avenue where they've knocked them all down and they're all b b apartment blocks, but if you get up to the kind of 80s and 90s, suddenly there are these palaces left over from the Gilded Age. So if you look hard enough in New York, you can find almost every stage of its history. We think of it as the modern city of the kind of mountains of glass, but actually it's there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I thought you did incredibly well, actually, at finding what you did. We, we shot in every borough, and uh, in Staten Island we shot Kansas. <laughs> so we, we made good use of New York City. Well, it's nice that you got to be in New York, though, yeah, to tell is. a New York story. It is, it is. The guy I feel sorry for is the guy that has to tell all the modern-day cars not to drive down that road in New York City. <laughs> that is not a job not that I would ever want to have. Yeah, you never want to spot a modern, you know, a Honda and going New, back. New Yorkers <laughs> don't, they're not like, oh, a movie, how exciting. Yeah. No, they don't no, feel that no. way. <laughs> we have time for one more. Um, I have a question from our website. One of your fans wants to know, what has been your most favorite thing about working together, and do you guys see yourself working together even more in the future on other projects? God, I hope so. <laughs> I, I mean, maybe this is my chance to say that, that I'm the luckiest person in the whole world, that, first of all, I found this man to direct the movie because no one else could have done it alive, no one, and that that this man wanted to write the screenplay to the book that I found. I mean, I, I literally the luckiest woman that is ever born. <laughs> That's what I'll say about that. How about you guys? Uh, well, yes, I, I think we'll all work together. We certainly, it feels like it, uh, Julian and I are working together on the Skilled Age project. And um, yeah, it feels like the beginning of a long relationship. I mean, So it's, long as you're not putting me in a corset. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I think the great thing about working with people again is you get their sort of shorthand. You don't have to start from zero every time. Right. Uh, I mean, if you already know you hate them, then that's another <laughs> kind of shorthand too. But, but if you can work together with people, you can see why people do it and always did and the same couple would make movies together or people would always work with this director or whatever it was, because you get to the sort of kernel of it so quickly. You don't have to faff around getting yeah. to know each other. And I, I think that that was helpful in this yeah. film, really. And also to a certain degree, I mean, you can kick and scream and yell and you know, you know it's okay. And sometimes that is part of the process. I mean, you try not to do it a lot, but yeah. uh, you know, there's this, this trust that comes from, from uh, knowing that, you know, I'm with someone who's okay, and it's okay for me to kind of have a meltdown, and you know we're going to go on, and we, we all want the same thing, mm -hmm. and that only can you can only, you earn that, you know, you earn that with time spent. Although my wife doesn't approve of meltdown. I know. <laughs> I shouldn't. Um, I, get such I shouldn't a encourage. Off. <laughs> and you can see the chaperone in select theaters March 29th. Yeah. Thank you guys theaters for being playing here. It's a very good, beautiful theater. You right have now. to see it. It probably looks beautiful on a big screen. It does. It does. Um, thank you all for being here. It's great to talk to you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Good question. Thank you.